Hello there, this is Rollspark125, back for yet another great reaction. Yes, yes. Uh, this is Prologue, Antares Confederacy, Stellaris Invicta Season 2. This is the very first Season 2 video. Somebody's been asking about this one for a while now, and uh, I put it in a poll, and it was the only video I got a vote. And I'll be doing a voice reaction today too because I'm still in pain with my legs, so it's just to make it easier for me, less painful for me. Uh, I hope you don't mind the voice reaction. And you'll be getting the video, don't worry, don't worry. And uh, yeah, there's not much else I can do really. It's either wait until my leg feels well enough to record again or just do this, you know? Uh, We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay, I'm looking forward to this because I haven't done a Stellaris for Victor 1 in a little while. Like five videos ago or six videos ago or something. And that was a while, long while ago, let me tell you. A couple of months? A couple of months ago? Yeah. Okay, well, let's jump in. Within the pages of the monumental work known as Ab Urbe Condita Libri, from the founding of the city, the Roman chronicler Titus Livius tells of a moment in the history of his empire when despair threatened to take hold in the heart of every citizen. Rome had been ravaged by the armies of the Gauls, and in the ruins of their capital, the Senate held a solemn meeting. They were faced with the difficult decision of whether to stay and rebuild, or flee for lands untouched by war. After untold hours of debate, the Senate seemed inclined to abandon Rome, and even the objections of Marcus Furius Camillus, the dictator whose legions had liberated the city, could not sway them. But in the last few moments before the vote was called, it is said a nameless Roman centurion, unaware of the debate, marched his column towards the gathered Senate, and feeling weary, uttered a single order to his men, his words struck with the divine weight of providence, and the Senate heard in them an omen from the gods that could not be ignored. They voted unanimously, ushering in the second founding of Rome. It was 2,549 years later, almost to the day, that the order first issued by that Roman centurion would be uttered again. The assembled captains of a lost host of humanity trapped by circumstances entirely different than those faced by the Roman senators of antiquity, yet with consequences entirely familiar, held a solemn meeting. They were to determine whether to stay and rebuild, or set forth blindly into the unknown. Again, perhaps with a sense of irony, those words were spoken, and again the man who spoke them had little appreciation for their weight, or what effect they would have on his people throughout the coming centuries. But those words were said all the same, and like the Senate before, the assembled captains voted unanimously, and like before, they ushered the founding of a new nation. That single Latin phrase is today inscribed on the foundation of the Antares Parliament, the centre of a growing power born from the determination of disparate peoples and cultures from every corner of the earth. It speaks of struggle, of hardship, of loss, and the great common power of humanity to not only endure, but thrive, regardless of circumstance. It was long ago pronounced amidst the ruins of Rome, repeated millennia later in the cargo bay of a colony ship, and is today held as the guiding words of the Confederate Republics of Antares. Hic manebimus optime. Here we will remain most excellently. Yeah, I was holding on to see uh, what he was going to say, what the phrase was. But he just kept going on and on and on. <laughs> Sorry it took so long for me to just pause it and talk. I was just waiting to hear the story, you know? And, uh... Yeah, the words themselves don't, don't hold any weight, like you say, you know what I mean? People speaking them didn't understand the weight of the words themselves, or what 
the the words meant to others. You know, he didn't know that the beat was was being held by the Senate of Rome to uh, decide their their future. Pretty much, should we stay? Should we abandon the city and 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 try elsewhere? You know, he was just telling his comrades, "Hey, we're going to stay here. We're going to be excellent when we do." Yeah. <laughs> Be excellent to each other. That's that's pretty much why we stay here. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And someone else spoke the same words later on, probably not understanding what it meant. Not understanding that others had heard him. You know, and what what it would mean, you know? That's that's great. I like that. The Earhart colonization program was the culmination of a century of arduous progress. The experiments with the first rudimentary wormhole generators, the construction of the orbital gate network, even the establishment of the International Alliance meant to oversee their use, each had been a painstaking process in their own right. But all were in the service of the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man had ever embarked. It was at first purely an act of faith and vision, for in spite of all the models and estimates, it was impossible to truly predict what benefits might await. Impossible until the whole of humanity witnessed the flag of a united Earth raised upon the surface of another world. The colonization of Alpha Centauri was difficult, as was Sirius, Tau Ceti, and Epsilon Indy. Each had their own respective eccentricities, and none of the first off-world colonies were truly amenable to human settlement. They were destined to instead be research outposts, mining sites, or test beds for future expeditions. But the discoveries within the Antares binary system changed everything. Okay, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to hear what they find. <laughs> I know, I shouldn't have stopped it. I should have kept it going. And, but I have to stop. I have to talk, especially now that I'm doing a, a voice reaction, you know? I have to uh, voice up. I have to talk. I've no choice, you know. Yeah, it's it's interesting that they just went out to find, uh, to to research things and and open up research posts and things like that. Eh? And then they found some things that changed everything, you know, so profound that they actually changed the way they looked at things. Stuff like that, yeah. Is that? I hope that's what it's going to be. Maybe a new power source or something, or. A mineral that will, will allow them to make a new power source, something like that, maybe? Maybe? I don't know. Oh, alien artifacts. Yeah, there we go. Maybe alien technology that's beyond theirs at the moment, that sort of thing? Okay, I should stop guessing and just play the video. Bye. Hidden in the outer orbit of the system's fainter, smaller star, a planet was found. It seemed to invite human habitation, with an atmosphere and environment only slightly dissimilar from that of Earth itself. Life, evolutionarily simple as it might be, had already flourished there, and it seemed likely that mankind might as well. The first pioneers to arrive were jubilant in their reports. The first outposts performed flawlessly. Antares, therefore, would be the natural candidate for humanity's first, large-scale, off-world settlement. For decades, Antares was prepared, crops planted, infrastructure built, and plans laid. Okay, I honestly had no idea, no idea that Antares was a planet. I thought it was like an organization or something. Within human, like like last time, you know. Pretty sure there was like an organization thing that was like the fight that worked within the Terran Union sort of thing. I had no idea this was a planet, you know. It was going to support human life you know that's pretty cool yeah i like that interesting i got a feeling this was going to be interesting yeah six million souls departed earth's orbit on march 1st 2159 the Earhart flotilla was the largest ever constructed carrying not only scientists engineers and specialists but their families they were to be the second wave of colonists and Antares eagerly awaited them. The ships entered the artificial wormhole without incident, 
and the peculiarities of interstellar travel meant it was weeks before Earth learned the first scheduled check-in had been missed. This was not entirely unexpected. No two transits were identical, but with every subsequent attempt at contact returning only static, hope fell into despair. Without resupply, the flotilla could survive for no more than six months. It is a testament to human optimism that attempts to reach them only ended after five times that. It's on their side or something? As a way to, for, to get to independence, away from Earth? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think that might be what it is. Interesting. Yes. Yes. This one's going to be a little bit different. I can, I can feel it. With the loss of the Earhart flotilla, the passion and enthusiasm that had defined the colonization era quietly vanished, and all future efforts cancelled. The disaster was blamed on previously undiscovered instabilities within the gate network, and there was some comfort in the knowledge that those on board the flotilla likely never had a chance to realize that something had gone wrong. Statues were built and choirs sung to the six million lost sons and daughters of Earth and the world tried to move on. Yet far across the universe, the pioneers of the Earhart Flotilla were very much alive. In place of the thriving colony meant to welcome them, and all its accompanying orbital infrastructure, supply networks, and communication relays, they had emerged within an entirely silent, entirely unknown, star system. Instead of the dual suns of Antares, oh. The new system had three, each orbited by a great many planets and moons. Shrouding them all was a miasma of ionized gases, a beautiful, all-encompassing swirl of colors. It was a vast, alien wilderness beyond anything previously discovered. <coughs> so they, they ended up in a completely different place, yeah? Something happened within the network that's maybe there was a malfunction, and instead of maybe them being lost in the wormhole, the wormhole spat them out somewhere else. You know, in order like a failsafe. You know, it's like it diverted them rather than you know, rather than destroy them. It allowed them to to divert to another another system or something. Maybe outside the network? That way they can't get back, sort of thing? Okay. Interesting. I know I keep saying interesting, so I can't help but it is interesting. It's very interesting. Attempts to identify where they now were in relation to Earth or Antares all failed. No recognizable constellations were found. No frame of reference identified. In a single moment, their dreams had been dashed and every soul aboard had to reconcile with the knowledge that they would never arrive at their intended destination. Without a warp gate, they were stuck. There even existed the possibility, however unlikely, that they had traveled not only through space, but through time, and might be hundreds or even thousands of years into the past or future. No evidence of this could be found, but the possibility remained. Realization Grief and fear threatened to overwhelm the flotilla, but there was simply no time. They could operate for six months without resupply, and every second wasted might mean the difference between the life and death of one, a dozen, or even thousands of people. Within the first day of their arrival, when every hope of returning to Earth had been extinguished, a new plan was set in motion. Under the hastily prepared Operation Longshot, Thousands of automated probes were sent across the system, identifying potential locations for human settlement. Before even the first results had been returned, the flotilla frantically moved to reorganize itself. Everything aboard each ship, from the enormous, next-generation atmospheric processors and gravitational tethers, to the farming equipment and industrial machinery, all the way down to individual colonists, seeds and gallons of water, had been the result of decades of planning. It was a triumph of logistics and administration on a scale beyond even the Martian settlements, the War of the Five Cities, the Apollo landings, or the Schlieffen plan. An army of officials had planned how the flotilla would be stockpiled down to the last spare tire, 
and in an instant, it had all been undone. Okay, I'll say this, how scary would that be, you know? It's not just the knowledge that, that you were sent to another place. You have no idea if you're going to survive. If you can find a planet or a moon or whatever that will support your life, or support everybody, you know? You have to find somewhere with an area big enough for them to land, yeah? And that ship would be their home, pretty much. That would be their, their main structure, yeah? That's crazy. Like, the only, the only thing they have to give them hope is their technology, their ingenuity, their, their supplies, things like that, you know? And none of that will, that will last forever. That's what it says, every second counts, you know? That'd be so terrifying, though. Especially if you have a family that's with you. Even if a verdant paradise was discovered within the system, the flotilla's population was too large to be supported by a single settlement. Combined with the risks of alien diseases, natural disasters, or potentially even hostile animal life, it was decided that the flotilla would be scattered. Dozens of smaller colonies, dispersed across multiple sites, it was hoped, would be better suited to survive whatever dangers might await. What this meant was that supplies and equipment concentrated on a select few, or even on single ships, had to be distributed across the whole of the flotilla. One fleet had to be turned into many. Under normal circumstances, selecting a site for future colonization might take decades. Soil needed to be tested, the atmosphere carefully analyzed, and plate tectonics studied. Tens of thousands of factors had to be considered, all of which took time that the rapidly decentralizing flotilla could not afford. When the last of the information had been relayed by the automated probes, the decision of where to settle would have to be made purely on whatever data they had managed to gather. While the probes had not recorded the existence of any paradise world, the nightmare scenario had also not come to pass. If the entire trinary system was home only to toxic worlds and dead moons, then the flotilla would be left to die in space. As if acting on their prayers, the system was home to a number of worlds which, like Antares, were home to flourishing, if evolutionarily simple, life. Nineteen sites were selected across eight planets scattered between each of the system's three stars. I have no idea if, uh... If these pictures we're seeing are actual representations of what, what these were supposed to look like. But that last one, although it looked pretty barren, with the rock formations, and had a blue sky with clouds and everything like that. Okay, that doesn't guarantee that that's to be able to support human life. But it looks pretty damn close, you know? You know what I mean? But looks can be deceiving, yeah? The size of these sites, and the number of resources, colonists, and ships allocated to each one varied considerably. Some sites encompassed entire continents, assigned hundreds of thousands of people, while others consisted of only a few scattered islands, intended to support only tens of thousands. Nor was the nature of these sites equal. From even the sparse details relayed back to the flotilla, it was clear some would take a much greater effort to be made habitable. Without any opportunity for last goodbyes or ceremonies, small groups of ships split away from the main flotilla and set course for what would become their new home. Each left with only the hope that what they had aboard would be enough for them to survive, in their memories of a world called Earth. In the final meeting of the Earhart leadership, representatives from each of the 19 sites made a pledge. While it was not the home they had expected, it was the one they had been given. In a unanimous decision, they declared the star system would be named Antares, and no matter how long it might take to overcome the fate rested upon them, one day, the pioneers of Antares would find one another, and together, whether in body or in spirit, head once more into the unknown. At first, several of the 19 sites remained in contact with one another. Gradually, however, the effort required to overcome the system's unique stellar interference and maintain the connection grew too strenuous. Goodbyes were said, and power reallocated to where it was better spent. 
Each of the 19 sites struggled in isolation. Some, in time, managed to overcome their new environment, transforming their colony ships into the centers of new, emergent nations. Okay, I might, I might have misheard when it uh, was talking about the flotilla. Uh, I thought it was one big ship, you know? But no, it was, a, it was like, a, like a fleet of smaller ships, you know what I mean? All together, sort of thing. I probably just misheard what they were saying. I was probably going by the pictures. <laughs> no, it's like a whole lot of different ships. And I, but I, did, I was right about them making the ships the center of their world, pretty much. You know? Yeah. It's, it's sad to hear that some of the system, or some of the colonies didn't, couldn't make it the way the other, but you sort of knew that already, you know? You knew that they wouldn't gonna they weren't gonna make it either way, you know. Uh, still sad though, you know. But some of them made it, and I'd like to know if they were able to get to the point where they were able to meet up with each other again, like they said, build up their resources, build ships, so they could travel to each other's colony and meet up again and. Be able to share supplies and things again. Maybe some of them have things that others don't. And they're able to like trade and things like that. That'd be cool. But it doesn't sound like that type of story, you know? I don't know. Others had to fight for decades simply to get their crops to grow or find clean water to drink. A few did everything they could to survive, only to learn that it would not be enough. Slowly, the first satellites were sent back into orbit, and contact was re-established across moons and across stars. Finally, 149 years after landing, the pioneers of Antares established regular contact with one another. The reunification was bittersweet, as the full picture of what had happened began to take form. 49 years? Wow. Okay, that's maybe not as long as I what I thought. I hoped to do it sooner than that, you know? Though I knew it might take longer, like, you know, a couple of hundred years or something. I would hope that they had done, done it within a hundred years. Yeah. Wow. That's a long time. That's like two generations right there. Of the 19 original sites, 11 had survived. Of the fallen eight, two had starved. Four had succumbed to disease, one had frozen, one had flooded, while the fate of the last was sealed. Among the surviving sites, the level of success varied considerably. A few nations had just barely managed to survive and would be reliant on outside help to truly thrive. Others had developed into one or sometimes Whoa. several nation states. Oh. Reunion Day was celebrated and honored across the system, but despite their common heritage, the sense of fellowship that had existed across the Earhart flotilla had been greatly eroded within the nations of Antares. In an idealistic attempt to remedy this, on the third annual Reunion Day, a new institution was created, the Antares Assembly. This forum was an intergovernmental attempt to maintain peace, security, and a new united Antares. Political friction grew nearly immediately. Several of the system's most powerful nations began maneuvering to assume the mantle of leadership. Mutually beneficial trade spiraled into opportunism and the establishment of rival trade blocks. Yeah, I, I, I kind of expected that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I expected some of them to be more technologically advanced than others. Maybe some of them had to give up their technology or their technology just went to waste over time because they couldn't maintain it. And then others would, would be more, you know, able to uh, it would be richer, pretty much. Have more supplies and stuff. And they would try and take control. Because, well, that's what the rich do, right? 
the rich want to become powerful, they want to take control of everything, you know, it's just the way it is. Okay, this is incredibly different than the others, I think, you know, it's, it's a story of tragedy, but hope, optimism, and now political intrigue, that, yeah, can't wait to see what happens next. Within a decade of Reunion Day, the Assembly's three largest nations, the Federation of Jat Farid, the Republic of Rativa, and the Republic of Chengatai, had each established their own supranational unions. The Association of Antares Nations, the Antares Community, and a Rico Pact each competed for political clout, attempting to win over the other nations of Antares. While the benefits of each alliance were considerable, the increasing tensions between the three only served to frustrate and alienate many of the neutral nations they were attempting to influence. On March 1st, 164 AL, the Republic of Maltawan, the Republic of Sabmadi, the Free State of Sagalo, and the Union of Than Janal established the non-aligned movement of Antares. Unlike the unions backed by the system's superpowers, the language which defined the non-aligned movement was clear and concise, promising mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, non-interference in domestic affairs, and most importantly, equality and mutual benefit. Okay, this is a sad prediction, but maybe inevitable. Uh, I think there's going to be a war. Yeah, that's, that's just humanity, right? I'm hoping wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that my prediction come turns out to be wrong. Yeah, uh, but humans are gonna human. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's pretty much it. The non-aligned movement quickly became the largest within the system, leading to the eventual termination of its three major competitors. By 189 AL, Jut Farid, Rativa and Chengatai had become the last major holdouts, and compared to the increasingly gridlocked Antares Assembly, the non-aligned movement had begun introducing sweeping laws and reforms that promised to further integrate its member nations. On September 4th, 191 AL, the last three holdouts were unofficially accepted into the non-aligned movement, which, as a face-saving measure, was immediately dissolved. Instead, the Antares Assembly underwent a complete reform, adopting both the structure, laws, and decorum of the non-aligned movement. Veto power and other benefits enjoyed by its largest nations were likewise removed from the institution. With Jut Farid, Rativa, or Chengatai no longer able to impede the decisions made by the Assembly, the first real talks of a system-wide unification began. The establishment of a centralized sovereign state, with the nations of Antares reduced to subnational entities, or even eliminated entirely, was seen as the most efficient option, but one that lacked the necessary political support. Only the smaller, poorer nations, those which would benefit the most from this arrangement, seriously considered it. Instead, a compromise was reached, and a system created that would wield considerable power in dealing with interstellar affairs, yet leave domestic issues in the hands of its constituent states. The Antares Assembly was officially dissolved on April 22, 202 AL. Simultaneously, the Confederate Republics of Antares were formally established, and Confederation Day celebrated across the system. It was both praised and criticized as being very different from the union that had been first imagined in the final meeting of the Earhart Flotilla. While certainly endowed with the potential to unify the star system, it also allowed its 11 member nations the implicit right of succession. Okay, so far there's been no war. Only unity, you know. Um, they've gone pretty much bent over backwards to, to make sure that they're unified. And I like that, I like to see it, you know? Uh, but who knows, you know? Who knows how, how long it'll take? But sooner or later, there's going to be a civil war or something. Like I said, that's just humans, really. Or maybe not, maybe they've, they've got to a point where they know they need each other to survive sort of thing, or to keep going, or to go forward, sorry. 
and to be better. Let's hope. Let's hope that's what it is. Okay, it could be, could be just me, but uh, that seems a little dangerous. Yeah. Um, somebody could just keep power. Yeah. As long as they're keeping the Parliament happy, it's pretty much a dictatorship, right? And yes, they have to hold elections every four years, right? But I think it is it the people that vote, or is it just the Parliament? I don't know. Sounds a bit uh, iffy to me, yeah? Maybe a little bit too... A little bit too easy to take control, or to keep control? Alright, I'm, I'm going to say it. There's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, politic, uh, politics information there. I, I didn't even get half, but I'm not a politics person. I'm, I'm not, like, somebody who knows how governments work or anything like that. I don't, I just, it's not that I, I couldn't know it. Of course I could. Anybody can. I just don't look into it, you know? It's something I'm not really interested in. Though, so maybe it should be, you know? Everybody should be interested in politics a little bit. I'm just not, really. I don't know why. It's just not my thing. But, uh, there's a lot of information there that I just fall asleep just listening to it. <laughs> That's just me personally, yeah. Uh, but let's just, I'm just, I'm just gonna try and get through it, yeah? A parliamentary confederacy. The authority of the government is today mainly limited to interstellar development and discovery, foreign affairs and defense. Its ability to interfere in the affairs of its republics is limited and addressed in a slightly vague general welfare clause within its constitution. The Confederation's executive office is headed by a prime minister who also serves as the head of state, but whose authority is relatively weak. This individual likewise serves as the head of the Cabinet of Ministers, which acts as the federal executive governing body of the Confederacy. There is no fixed term of office, nor any kind of term limit, and a Prime Minister can remain in office so long as they maintain the confidence of the majority of the Antares Parliament. There is an informal tradition, dating back to the non-aligned movement, however, that a government must call an election once every four years. The I was going to say that's dangerous, you know, allowing somebody to stay in office beyond their, you know, no no time limit. And they've got so much of this, you know, like their, their coat buttons up with many different things rather than just like a few things. Or like one or two things. But no, apparently they don't have much power. Yeah. Although they have all these positions. The main power is with, you know, the... Uh, the many rather than the one, right? It's all just for show. Almost like a figurehead in some ways, you know? As long as he keeps the the real people in power happy, then he can stay in office for as long as he wants, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's kind of dangerous too, I suppose, in a way. You know, the more or less lying to the people, allowing, to, allowing them to believe that somebody's in charge, one person's in charge, but they aren't. It's all just, maybe it's the common knowledge that he doesn't really have that much power. You know what I mean? It's, it's a position that's, that's held to, uh, he serves the people, in other words, and he serves the Senate and he serves, serves all this kind of stuff. But he's not, he's not a tyrant. You know what I mean? He can't, he doesn't have the power to, to take control. I don't think, right? Major political power within the Confederacy is instead held by the Parliament of the Confederate Republics of Antares, or simply the Antares Parliament. A bicameral legislature, it has two separate chambers, an upper house known as the Senate, and a lower house called the Chamber of Representatives. Yeah, this, this kind of reminds me of the UK and many of the monarchies today, where the, the head of state you know, has a lot of position and maybe some power, but doesn't use it sort of thing, you know. But most of the, it can be removed if, you know, take things too far sort of thing. UK is the same, you know, the king is the head of state. 
uh, the head of the government and all that, you know, and uh, every time a new prime minister has to be sworn in, you know, the king meets with them and, you know, you can't stop a prime minister from being brought in because voted for by the people. Well, you could. You could actually stop it. Or maybe say to the party, hey, I don't like this person. Choose another leader. Something like that, maybe, possibly. I doubt it, though. I doubt they could actually do that, you know, and stay in power. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. But, uh, doesn't mean they have to like the person. <laughs> Personally, you know? Just have to get on with it. There are few qualifications to become a senator, only that the individual is not beholden to economic vagaries or turmoil, and a citizen of the republic they've been chosen to represent. In comparison to the Chamber of Representatives, whose members are apportioned to the republics by population size, and is therefore seen as representing the population, the intent of the Senate is to act as the voice of the republics. While officially the upper house of parliament, it is first only in order of precedence for the purposes of protocol. As a matter of both practice and custom, it is the Chamber of Representatives that is dominant within parliament, and to whom the Prime Minister is solely responsible. While legislation can be introduced by either house, the Senate is meant to act as a place of sober second thought. The approval of both houses is necessary for legislation, but the Senate has only rejected on average two bills per year in its short history. Yeah, so it's run by, like, more or less, like a lot of the uh, Western governments today, yeah? There's the main... Or, or like the monarchy today. There was a head of state, and then there was like a prime minister or a president or whatever, right? And then, like some countries like the United States, I think the head of state is the president or something like that there. Yeah, so this president or, or whatever they are called, I think it is president. They're, uh, they're like that, right? They have, they're the head of state, but they're also the head of the government, right? That's the idea. That's, I'm getting confused. There's a lot of information here, you know, but I'm trying to get across what I'm, what I'm, what I'm thinking and the words just aren't fair, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of information here, but more or less what it is, is the person in charge isn't really completely in charge. Yeah? The Senate's in charge. You know, the, the president or whatever does have a lot of power, but it's conditional that they stay in line i don't i don't take not do a political stuff you know this is why a lot of it's just confusing it's just, just gobbledygook you know you get the general idea but a lot of it's just i think they actually set it up just to confuse the crap out of you you know <laughs> that's my general consensus on it the Chamber of Representatives is, in contrast to the Senate, a democratically elected body. There are currently 809 members in the lower house, with this number expected to increase with the total population of the Confederacy. Seats within the chamber are distributed roughly in proportion to the population of each republic. The Antares Constitution, however, contains several provisions regarding this method of representation, and as a result, there is some regional malapportionment relative to the total population. Such clauses are everywhere within the Constitution, intended to balance the will of the people with the power of the republics. This means that the efficiency of the Antares government is always in a state of flux, with both the republics and people able to disrupt legislation yet not always enough to approve it. Backhand deals and a variety of committees, both official and unofficial, have become the preferred method of passing legislature, and the outcome of most votes is almost always known before they are brought to the floor. So, corruption. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, yeah, when votes are known before they, they come to uh, the floor, before people actually vote for them. It means backhand deals, you know, have been made, like you said, you know, this is the preferred method. I'm sure a lot of our governments today do the same thing, right? There's no way to know for sure that somebody won't change their minds or get a deal somewhere else or 
it happens, you know, I'm sure. But yeah, when, when your government is, is making decisions before they're supposed to, sort of thing, you know? They're getting people in line before. I, mean, I suppose in some ways they have to do that. In some ways it's the only way to get things done the way they want. But it just sounds corrupt as hell, you know? It just sounds like the worst kind of political practice that you could think of. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I mean, I, I'd say I'm sure a lot of our governments do the same thing, you know? They, they pretty much know what way it's going to go before they even get in there sort of thing. And that's not the way it should be done. At all. No. Democracy should not work that way. You know? Combined with a lack of history, tradition and precedence, the Antares Parliament can be often chaotic and sometimes bordering on violent. Shouting matches have repeatedly erupted and are in danger of becoming routine. Together with the High Court of Antares, the Office of the Prime Minister and Parliament of Antares are all located in Sigalo, the capital city of Antares. While a city within the Republic of Avjari Vet, Sigalo exists as a distinct federal entity. While many of its constituent republics maintain their own official languages, none have been granted official status by the wider confederacy. French, Arabic, Swahili, Spanish, and Vietnamese are most predominantly used in government affairs, while Russian, English, Standard Hindi, Portuguese, Mandarin Chinese, and Turkish are also occasionally used when dealing with specific republics. The Antares Constitution expressly prohibits the adoption of any official language, and this provision is unlikely to change in the immediate future. The same restrictions apply in adopting any kind of state religion. Islam is the largest faith across the republics of the Confederacy, followed closely by sizable Christian, Hindu, and atheist communities. The overwhelming desire to not favor any language or religion at the expense of any other is on the surface meant to place each republic on equal footing within the federal government. However, multiculturalism has emerged as a key part of every state within the Confederacy, the natural outcome of the flotilla's initial demographics. I like that. I like the fact that they're not adopting any specific sort of language or religion. You know what I mean? They're, it's supposed to be, it's for everybody, yeah? That's the way it should be. That's not the way we do things. Obviously, different countries have different religions, as their basis, and I suppose they're the same. Like, they're made up of different planetary things, you know? Uh, and each one has its own religion, its own languages, stuff like that there. But the main body of it all doesn't pick sides. And I like that. I love that. I love, I love the fact that probably the closest thing that I can think of right now would be Europe, right? Well, Europe is uh, prominently Christian, right, as far as I know. Um, I don't think, I don't know what, what way the European Union actually sees religion or whether or not they accept one religion as its main thing or do they just shy away from that you know what i mean obviously they they have different languages and all that there. they can't choose just one language as the main language you know what i mean they have to treat all languages as equal sort of thing yeah i mean that's that's a good way of doing it uh it's hard to talk about uh this stuff because i don't really know much about european sort of thing or what other kind or what kind of unions would would have something like this the united states is one country so so it's not we have a different state so it's not the same but probably the closest thing would be europe for this yeah different countries with different laws different ideals different religions possibly or different views on Christianity, perhaps. You know, it's 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 a rough thing to to delve into. You know, because it's just you know what what do you do when it comes to religion? When most people say, "Oh, this religion's our religion," 
But you get other people coming and saying, oh, but but you, you can't just have that religion. Well, what about our religion? You know, well, what about where we believe in this religion? The same religion you have, but we just believe so slightly differently. You know, you... Well, where do they do it? I'm sure somebody will jump in the comment section maybe and, and let me know, but... I don't know if they have a, a general religion. I think Christianity would, be, Christianity would probably be the closest thing that they have to that. Um, but there's a lot of Muslim believing people within Europe now, I think, you know, immigration and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's hard to talk about that sort of thing without really knowing the basis of it all. The Earhart Flotilla consisted mainly of settlers from Africa, Central and Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, Oceania, and South America, the regions generally left out of the first wave of colonists. In an attempt to force genetic diversity, these populations were deliberately intertwined once the flotilla arrived in the system and their survival across successive generations was in doubt. As a result, the modern nations of the Confederacy are uniquely culturally and ethnically diverse. While intolerance and domestic tensions have not been eliminated entirely and remain a major problem in several of the republics, the Confederation's constitution aims to foster further integration, even at the expense of political efficiency. So the same divides that exist now exist in this world, in this reality too, yeah? It's the way it goes. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Humans are going to human, yeah? <laughs> That's just the way it is. There's not much you can do about it. Not all cultures, not all people's mix. It's, it's some people are just like oil and water, yeah? You just can't mix. It's the way it is. These quirks in the Constitution have resulted in some strange, seemingly contradictory practices. This is nowhere more apparent than in the organization of the Confederate military. Divided into two major branches, the Confederate Navy and Confederate Army, major restrictions exist in how both these services must be raised and deployed within the Antares system. The Confederate Navy is the nation's space warfare branch, while many of the republics operate their own orbital branches, the Navy is the only institution within the Confederacy permitted to operate warships of a specific size and capabilities. As a matter of law, however, the federal government is forbidden to independently construct or order the construction of these warships. Every ship in the fleet is in practice, one that has been donated by individual republics. By contrast, while the republics are legally allowed to construct such warships, they are prohibited from operating them. While such an arrangement has the potential to cripple the Confederate Navy in times of crisis, such laws are mostly ceremonial, and the federal government has on numerous occasions placed unofficial orders for warships which are then serendipitously constructed and donated by various republics. The same kind of restrictions have been placed on the Confederate Army, which for all its history has been comprised of only a select few administrative and logistics personnel. It exists mainly theoretically, as the Confederate Army is barred from operating on any territory administered by the Republics, leaving essentially nowhere within the star system where the branch would be allowed to mobilize. The lack of any armed conflict across the entirety of the Antares system's history has left little necessity for such a force, and even the Republics themselves maintain only small, garrison forces, not suited to offensive operations. Okay, that is dangerous as hell. I mean, humans already know they're not alone in the universe. Yes, they're in a relatively peaceful place that doesn't seem to have... Um, or to be noticed by alien species. But then, how do they know that? How do they know that, that people haven't been watching them for a while now, you know? Watching how they do things, learning about their culture, things like our cultures, you know? I don't know. It's dangerous not to have a standard military, or at least have a military trained. Because when war comes, how, are you, you going to rely on conscripts? Who are, who are loosely trained and have only been recently trained sort of thing, you know? That's a dangerous thing too. You need time to train people to get them some experience. Even if they don't have experience in real war, at least have, let them have as much experience as you can give them in training, you know? 
In the event of war, the Confederate government has the authority to call for volunteers, but not to enact conscription, which remains the sole right of the republics. Any division granted to the Confederacy would be both raised and equipped by their respective republics, and how such a command structure might fare in wartime remains a matter of concern. Many fear that individual republics might leverage the deployment of any divisions raised in an attempt to guide national strategy. The need for military forces at all remains a matter of contention within Parliament. While nations on Earth had detected seemingly artificial broadcasts of repeating mathematical patterns, unequivocal proof of alien life had not yet been found at the time of the Earhart Flotilla's departure, much less the desire to defend against such threats. Oh, I was wrong. This is before that. This is before the Tyrum showed up, yeah? Their, their flotilla was sent, was sent out before they knew other alien risks existed. I didn't know that. I don't know why I didn't know that. Probably said that at the start. I just missed it. So, so yeah, this is, this is before the humans were, were almost destroyed, pretty much. So they came away the the best technology that they had at the time yeah so it makes me wonder obviously the tyrant have come and gone probably by then and humans were starting to rebuild on earth maybe half rebuilt maybe the greater terran union has has uh already kicked off who knows or maybe they'll meet up with them soon Makes me wonder: Will will the future enemies of the of the DTU will they meet these people first, these humans first, before they meet the other humans from Earth? That would be interesting. Do these people someday maybe evolve to a point where they no longer see humans as kin? And maybe they become enemies of Earth. That would be interesting too. Obviously, we're going to see all this. This is only the first episode. Can't wait to see what happens next. I will be doing more of these, obviously, because they're getting more interesting. They really are. The ardent will to maintain military forces by both the leadership of constituent republics and the Confederacy is often baffling to the general populace, which has rarely supported such measures. What has never been revealed, however, is that a small part of the founding myth of Antares has been built on a lie. When the Earhart Flotilla was to have emerged in their intended destination, they were to have received eight scheduled messages from Earth, each containing only trivial details concerning items that might have changed during transit. The colonists were informed that these messages never arrived, lost during whatever anomaly threw them off course. But in truth, the Earhart Flotilla received all eight, and at least 100 others broadcasts not intended for them, but somehow received by the flotilla all the same. Most were scrambled and garbled, impossible to truly understand, but the small number that have been restored are terrifying. Few have seen them, only the highest military and government officials of the republics and the confederacy, but even the most resolute pacifist among them have been forced to agree that a standing army might be necessary. So even if humans on Earth don't know that aliens exist yet, the Federation does, right? They've intercepted, they're so far out in space that they've been able to intercept these alien transmissions. Oh, and probably videos, right? Not just voice, but videos too, right? Visuals. So they've seen what they look like. Question is, do the aliens also know what they look like? Have they been able to intercept communications about from them? Yeah, see, that's this is why you need a standing army. <laughs> I was right. I was right. There's aliens out there, and maybe they are not aware of the humans yet. But someone tells me they are, because if the flotilla intercepted some messages from these other cultures, other other species. I guarantee that they know about the humans. They probably intercepted stuff from humans too. You know? Is this maybe why the Tyrum go to Earth? 
Is this how they find out about Earth? Go there? Because they meet humans? Maybe they're able to steal some of their technology or something and find out where they came from? I doubt it, because they, they don't even know where, where Earth is in this expanse, you know? They, they have no coordinates to get back to Earth. They don't even know where it is. So maybe Tyrone find Earth by, by chance. Or maybe not. Maybe they'd learn from Earth through these humans somehow. Maybe they read, them, read their minds or something. Who knows? They get their knowledge and don't really know where Earth is, but have a general idea of what, what Earth is and, and where it should be. Maybe they have other ways of knowing. You know? Uh, like their knowledge could maybe lead to tie them to Earth, even though the hum humans themselves don't really know how to get there. Maybe the uh, Tyrum's uh, expansive knowledge of space transcends humans at the moment. And they're able to piece it together and then go to Earth. It's possible, it's possible, who knows? The Confederate Republics of Antares is still a young nation, one faced with a daunting challenge. Over two centuries ago, their ancestors left Earth for a new home, only to unexpectedly arrive in another. For all the division between the Republics and the apparent weakness of the Confederacy, the will and desire to seek out Earth has never wavered. On the foundation of the Antares Parliament and countless other buildings and institutions across the star system are etched the words, Hic Manebimus Optime. Here we will remain most excellently. It was spoken first within the Senate of the Roman Empire, again within the cargo bay of a colony ship within the Earhart Flotilla, and is today the guiding words of the Antares Confederacy. The flags of eleven republics speak to the fortitude, courage, and spirit needed in the pursuit of those words. The graves of eight colonies speak to the necessity of sacrifice to live, fight, and if need be, die in the pursuit of those words. And the emblem of one nation speaks to the spirit of the human race to embrace cooperation, mutual respect, and a resolute spirit in the pursuit of those words. Not only when it is easy, but when it is hard. Today, as the citizens of the Confederacy look outward, not only to one another, but past the boundaries of their star system, that phrase has taken on a new meaning, and one small addition. Here, we will remain most excellently, but not here alone. Okay, that is the end of the video. Wow, that was, that was great. You know, it was far more interesting than the normal GTU. I mean, the GTU thing was, was interesting too. But there's something about being lost in space and overcoming adversity and, and all these trials to come out on top. I mean, so many others lost their lives and who, the ones left behind, they built other nations and then these nations came together to make one big nation. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it was always their goal to, 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 to work towards communication with each other and to get back to find out who survived, who didn't, sort of thing. And even though they didn't hear from, from a lot of the, uh, the ones that died, they still went out and looked for them anyway and only found remains of, of dead, pretty much. Dead civilizations that, that didn't get a chance to, to rise up. And they're always working on finding Earth again. That's the the one goal, is to find Earth and protect themselves. Obviously, yeah. This is this is really interesting. Obviously, this is just one sort of scenario that happened when they played the game, right? This is this is how Solaris goes. You know, it's a game. They played the game and a certain way. Then they make stories about it and stuff. And I like that. I love that. I I think it's great what they're doing. You know. Gives us something, gives so, people like me who haven't played the game a way to enjoy this universe. And I'm sure you enjoy it too. I hope you enjoyed the reaction. 
I recorded this video in two halves because my OBS crashed on me and it was so late that I just didn't want to have to restart it and get everything going again make sure my, my earbuds were, were connected I thought I'll, I'll connect it to I'll, I'll record the rest of it tomorrow earlier and I didn't I thought uh, life intervened and family stuff intervened and I wasn't able to get it done. I'm only getting it done now. This is like over a week later. This video took a long time for me to finish. Um, I still have to edit it. And it's only a voice reaction. It's not even a video one. Sorry it took so long. You know, it's just life intervened. You know, it's the way it goes. And I'm only able to do voice reactions right now because of my leg. My legs get a lot better. A little lot better. I just don't feel confident enough to sit in a way that might hurt it. You know, that's why I'm doing a voice reaction still. I got 2,000 subscribers recently, which was amazing. I've been promoting the channel on other websites, my other channel too. And I got some great responses. On this channel, I got to well, over 1,000 subscribers, and that was amazing. So I'm over, I'm almost 3,000 subscribers now. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, I promoted it on the website again but i haven't got the same response obviously you can only do it i have to find other websites maybe it's something to promote it on my other channel was also promoted and it got a lot of views too over a thousand like no well 1500 views it got it got a lot and enough views sorry subscribers and the views went up as well obviously for a short period of time but they haven't gone up again recently I'm going to have to try and promote them again on other channel or other websites and things. It just costs me, you know, costs me money and stuff, but I'm going to have to try and get it done. Because hopefully it can help this channel take off. If you haven't subscribed, please do so because it really does help. Like the videos, comment on the videos. Not just this one, but other videos you've watched of mine. Comment on them too. I will try to get back to you, even if it's just a heart, you know something it means the hearts let you know i've read your comment at least you know let you know that i've taken the time to read your comments i hope to get back on the video soon within the next week or two hopefully or at least recording and until next time i am out of here